Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Agricultural Data Arms Race. I'm your host, Sid Codes, and today we'll be exploiting a tractor load of vulnerabilities in the global food supply chain in good faith. So I just want to start off with a quick photo. It's from about the 1960s, and it's of a farmer using a hand tractor. Uh, this is a hand-operated tractor, as you can see. Compare that with the brand new John Deere 7450 Pro Drive Autonomous Forage Harvester with GPS sensors all over it, uh, a chainsaw pretty much at the front, and weighing over you know 10 or 15 tons. So this is a monster of a device. Like I said, it's autonomous, so it can uh, run off on you if it's in the wrong hands. So I just want to start by saying none of the research today was paid for. It's all done in good faith, and nothing today represents me or any of the people involved, our employers, past employers, or future employers. We're not under any gag orders. The only thing we are sort of weary about is vulnerabilities that we can't mention, that we would like to mention, uh, that's still going with some vendors. And all the content in the slides is Creative Commons Zero, apart from any other stuff that relates to other brands. In that case, all trademarks, logos, and brands belong to them and then remain the property of their respective owners. Just quickly on myself, I'm a good hacker man. I've got a GitHub, a Twitter, a newly built LinkedIn. I've got a couple of massive projects. My biggest project is probably Docker OSX with 15k stars on GitHub and 100k Docker pools. So pretty much just QEMU, uh, Mac OS, but you can do a lot of stuff with it, including iMessage for security research purposes only. Um, I just want to start by showing you a quick map, emphasizing the amount of brown little spots all over the place. And what these are, if you don't know already, which a lot of you might know, is it farms. Yeah, you can actually zoom right into those farms. And uh, I don't want to obviously dox anyone, but yeah. Um, if you were able to access all of those farms, you would be able to do things like overspray chemicals under the field. So if you were able to overspray chemicals on the field, you could permanently deny of service to that farm by simply overspraying one season by literally loading up the fertile ground with uh, too many chemicals and then the next year or even the next 50 years it will be unfertile or unsuitable ground for use so you could permanently deny service to a farmer's crop by literally a few lines of malicious code so that what that's what i'm trying to get out here that denial of service is a huge impact for the agricultural industry in that um, say for example coming to harvest season Right now is winter wheat harvest for some farmers, depending on where you are in the US. But um, you can actually deny service to those farmers. And that also occurs during seeding time or planting time and also spraying time. Any one of these parts of the supply chain of food and ag, every single one of those parts needs to be online, 99.99999 SLA. If it does go down, farmers will tell you that they're pretty much screwed for that season and they can lose crops. and some of the crops cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and if that information or the login details or something like that was provided to a third party aka a state actor um, they could do something like a malicious update to the tractor they could play with the ecu they could send it into overdrive they could drive it into the wrong location they could send it into plant the wrong field um, most disturbingly one of the guys who mentioned this on my on my blog i did earlier is that they could offset the tractor by X amount of degrees or, 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 or coordinates and actually drive the tractor onto the highway, into a river, through a fence and another example of permanent denial of service. So uh, what we consider, you know, downtime in a website for five minutes might be the difference between tractor driving, auto track goes off, tractor keeps driving, tractor hits a tree or injures someone. And the big question here is why did we actually start looking at agriculture and why is it such a big issue? And why didn't a lot of people start looking at it? The main reason was that nobody else was actually looking at it. So that's probably the biggest reason. And the biggest uh, reason that I started looking at it was someone who I know very well named Paul Roberts from the Security Ledger mentioned to me that, hey, it's really weird that uh, there's no CVEs in John Deere's products. And I go, well, what does John Deere actually have? And then I thought about it for a bit and did a bit of research and he introduced me to a couple of guys one of the guys, namely the first guy that I met was Willie Cade, and his grandfather was actually on the board of directors at John Deere. And his grandfather actually had a patent with uh, John Deere, and that was including this manure spreader that's down there in the lot, bottom left. And Willie's obviously uh, knows a lot about farming and a lot about the history of the activities of some of these farming companies and all the way through to a fully autonomous GPS controlled um, mother load of, of just 
steel and aluminium and danger. And also the emphasis of relying on all this equipment to feed every single one of the people in the world. And not just that, but also feed you know, all sorts of different industries. Biofuels, biogas, uh, carbon emissions, etc. The second guy that I was introduced to is Kevin Kenny, who's a big right to repair enthusiast, uh, as, is, as is Willie. Uh, Kevin lives out in Nebraska. Um, he's an engineer and a farmer. Uh, this photo is from a Bloomberg article that he did uh, in relation to how John Deere is uh, screwing over a lot of farmers. Uh, and you can see kind of the, get sort of the gravity of what's going on by the size of the wheel that he's sitting in. Uh, these aren't ordinary wheels. You know, they're not cheap to replace either. I'll just quickly breeze over the hackers. We've got myself, Weber Fett, uh, Dorka Devil, John Jackson, John J. Hacking, uh, Regex, uh, which is Robert Willis. We've got Wormer, Chief Cool Arrow, who is a who's currently MIA, don't know where he is, and Kelly Cowardice, who also helped us in a previous project. So every single farm is connected, whether it be through 5G, which is incoming. Obviously, we have LTE, 4G, we've got 2G and 3G, the older connections or slower connections. LoRa works out in the field because there's no obstructions and everyone can actually communicate over long, long distances and there's no obstructions usually on the farm. Obviously we have Wi-Fi, there's GPS involved, GPRS, which is still involved in Ukraine. And then we've got three, three different types of major corrections that I've mentioned called WAS, RTK and NTRRP. So WAS and RTK are radio based, but then there's NTRRP, which is kind of like NTP. So they're basically ping based, um, location uh, information so pretty much pinging back to servers or wi-fi signals to be able to f find your find your device based on triangulation of that of that ping time this is a rough uh, diagram not to scale in any way whatsoever but that's gps and then we use gps plus another one of those correction signals to actually triangulate the exact position of a device and you can imagine planting and not having that sort of accuracy you'll be planting Every C would be, you know, for example, or every row might be dipping into the next row or the row before it. And the data, what does it do? Well, it provides the price of corn. Corn is used in both ethanol production and it's also fed to cows to make livestock and other, other types of beef and, and pork, etc. But it's also used in ethanol um, and all that data is also considered some way or another a trade secret. Considering all the data that a farmer gets, which is in the, scene, the top, top left of the image, that is actually the row with a overlay of the farm getting, it's quite dark, but it's an overlay of the farm getting planted onto. And you can see that that data is technically a trade secret. And who has access to that data? Because all of that data at the moment, as you can imagine, is getting shoved back through a 4G or LT connection or until the farmer gets back into range, it'll get sent back to the, to the operation center, which John Deere owns. Um, and that's called the John Deere Operations Center, which we hacked into, and we'll get into that in a bit. So the biofuel sector is a sector of the agricultural industry that relies on amassing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then burning it as biofuel. biofuel. And this is the Windows P background, obviously, and at the bottom it's been used as a vineyard at some point in time. I don't know if it's the exact one, but it looks good. Other uses of the data include carbon credits, so the carbon offset market, and a guy named Shannon Segwick, uh, who's a farmer in Australia, turned managing director of a couple of ag security companies, he mentioned to me this, and I thought about it and looked into it a bit more, and apparently it's mandatory in some places, for example, Australia, depending on which industry you're in, and it can be voluntary. So if that data were to go missing, okay, so if that data was to go missing through some sort of attack, then that would be catastrophic for that sort of government rebate-based industry or mandatory industry. Now, you can actually simulate, uh, this is my developer account at John Deere, you can simulate those devices that I showed you earlier in the tractor cab. So you can simulate, for example, a self-propelled -propel forage harvest, and I'll give you an example of one now. Now, this is one. This is a big, powerful, probably 300, 400, 500 horsepower machine. Um, it just shreds, eats up everything that it comes into contact with. And that there gets used as forage, which forage is usually used as, as feeding or biofuel or biomass and things like that. And basically, you can have a look at the big teeth on it, it will shred anything that it comes into contact with. So that's the 9000 series, it's got auto track, so that will automatically drive and steer the tractor for you and it'll stay in line using auto track. Auto fuel, it will automatically calculate how far it has to shoot the, the auger, uh, and it's got a display, it's the 4640 based on Yocto Linux, 
which we'll get into later. And it's covered in sensors and all this sort of stuff and it will automatically adjust and change speed and then it'll line up with the cart next to it. Grain cart, make sure it's all aligned up. It's all autonomous and see the big yellow dome. It's pretty small, but it's on the top of the head of the tractor. That's the GPS unit. I've got auto lock for staying in line. And then all that data gets sent back to your Windows 7 computer at home, Windows Vista. And that gets translated through to someone at Windows 10, the John Deere Operations Center, someone manually handling the data. We've got some awesome features like John Deere Connected Support, where someone out in the middle of a field in a undisclosed location can actually log into your tractor and control it remotely, per se, which is fantastic. Uh, as you can see, we've got remote access, so we just remote into the tractor at any time and that includes staff members. So there's two massive things I want to point out on that remote access display screen is that one, uh, you can send files to Tractor. Two, it was copyrighted in 2014, so it's quite old. And three, you can remote access the Tractor. That's really important because what we'll show you soon is that we were able to manipulate this in some way. And then John Deere service support also. Obviously, if there's a threat actor on the inside, they could just automatically access anyone's tractor through the master dealer service admin portal which is fantastically set up so threat actors can do um, little amounts of damage sarcastically so then I started to dip my feet in and basically I'm just going to quickly glance over the first vulnerability which was a username of vulnerability username enumeration one where I could obviously enumerate usernames based on that and I got the fortune 1000 I won't go into it because it's kind of boring but I got the fortune 1000 CSV file submitted that as an API request um, and got back 20% domains, sorry, 20% of those accounts being registered. This is me adding pieces of equipment to my farm that I technically don't own uh, for research purposes, but I've just picked up these numbers from a auction website and there's a lot of data involved. So all it will say is this, this machine is already added, but in the response, there's a ton of data. So all it will say equipment already exists and I've had to skip a little bit here because there's a lot of PII including first name, last name, lease, address line 1, address line 2 and everything like that and I've had to skip that obviously because it's PII. So Vice covered this, writer named Lorenzo, great guy, he covered it in a story, bugs allowed hackers to dox all John Deere tractor owners. So originally the article did say all but um, John Deere apparently reached out to them as opposed to reaching out to us and said that it's only some tractors and the, the actual co conclusion there is it's only new tractors, which is probably even worse. So shortly after that, a hacker named Wubba Fett reached out to me and told me he's got five XSS vulnerabilities in, in the John Deere uh, website. And I asked him if he could reach out to me on Signal, we can have a look. And that's when we found um, his motives. So I said to him, there's a really funny comment where I said, uh, fuck doing this for free, where he said, well, at the end of the day, I'd rather do this for free than lose food. And someone's going to save their dumb asses. And he obviously mentioned it's a John Deere, and he said that he's got vulnerabilities to report. And we tried to report it to John Deere, so we got so we, were, we were granted safe harbour, which means we can do whatever the hell we want, um, as long as it's in good faith, and, they'll do, and they won't do anything in terms of legal uh, issues. So once you click that link, it brings you to their website, and that allows you to submit a form and then that form gets you onto their hacker one program of which i was the first researcher in and i've now since left the program because it's a nda program there's no bounties they've got swag apparently now which i don't give a shit about because i don't want to give my address to them uh, but here's the first vulnerability the xss so basically it's just a dom based xss which i'll get into later but this is just me pretty much showing you um, the xss obviously xss is a really basic vulnerability but what it does show you is that they they're not taking into consideration basic vulnerabilities. They're not taking into consideration the fact that somebody can just literally uh, produce basic, you know, 2015 level XSS on one of their major parts of the websites. What would be my manager is it's a supply network page and I could just log in as a guest or not even log in. And we can also see the dev or QA part of the supply network, which was even more exciting. So this is the John Deere uh, supply network page where you can Due to new functionality, just supply a purchase order number and receive all the information back related to a, a purchase. It's for suppliers only, but we were able to access it, of course. And um, as you can see here, this is me just putting in a star. And then the response apparently 
for some reason gives you a invoice number of 0106 which we then further used to try and enumerate other invoice numbers in some way and we ended up seeing that it's an IBM DB2 database which I didn't have much uh, knowledge about but what it did do in the response is give us a really nice constructed uh, error message that shows the offending query um, and showing that we were able to sort of inject it in some way because that was not the original query whatsoever and some more errors from uh, John Deere copyright 2011 and for some reason they still had the, the 1999 version of that portal up uh, with lots of cool different buttons we could press and the single sign on didn't work so I don't know why it was still up or we didn't test it enough but that should probably not be there uh, as you can tell it's quite old uh, John Deere employee access which we obviously shouldn't ha be able to just enter it's the John Deere University um, that's the John Deere machine book this is a really funny device actually this is the this is the place where you go to book machines demo units to provide to farmers like youtubers or something like that like influencers uh, or demo units to whatever and there's a little DOM based XSS that we've put in the bottom of the reservation page you can see there it's got the back tick and sorry it's got the double quote and the right arrow so not only that but we were able to book units expect units we we're able to cancel appointments uh, reassign tractors to certain locations which doesn't sound exciting but what we did do, which was kind of exciting, was we just injected the database and pulled out every single row for every single session. But yeah, we could see every demo unit that was ever provided and all the John Deere's names, email addresses that we used to book those units. Uh, then we found something specific. Okay, so this is what the, this is the Deere single sign-on SAML edge server instruction readme file. So John Jackson and Regex discovered a CBE in the platform named Pega or Pega and what it is is like a default admin credential style bug where if you don't change it you pretty much just give everyone access to your remote Pega server and that's what we did it's got a 6.6 .6 for some reason uh, NIST gave it a 4.9 I'd probably give it a 7 or an 8 depending on um, what the what the company is but in this case it completely destroyed integrity and confidentiality of John Deere's one as you can see, we had access to the single sign-on, the SAML. There's a John Deere uh, backup part there. We've got the request approval. We've got all sorts of cool stuff. Um, there's the edge server we got from there. And then interestingly, the, from that information, we've got some administrative uh, PEGA credentials. As you can see, I've had to blur out the, the password and the system ID name and the time difference and all this sort of stuff just to make sure you can't I guess replicated, it, but it's the process Pega Commander. Uh, secondly, we've got a portal admin server data administrative account credential password here as well, which is ridiculous that we shouldn't have this. We've got a security audit log, which we should be not able to view. Um, and we could see our own selves in there, and then Pega admins logging in for some reason. And then we have this gold piece of whatever the heck it is. It is there. It is their Okta signing certificate, I believe. So what we've got blurred out is the ID number that relates to their Okta account. We've got the KMS, which is their, I guess that's the PEGA administrative Okta address URL that goes to sign tokens, etc. We've got the original signature password blurred out. Uh, we've got the prod symbol there, so you know it's in use. We've got the original decryption password also blurred out for obvious reasons. With the signing certificate details and you can see clearly that it's John Deere uh, it's Okta related and furthermore I've only blurted out once for some reason and then we've got the single sign on SAML URL related to John Deere's side and then down the bottom we've got a decryption certificate and a beautiful expiry date of 2029 from this just backtracking this can pretty much allow us to upload files to any user log in as any user destroy any farm run any farm off the road upload whatever we want, download whatever we want, destroy any data, log into any third party accounts. We could literally do whatever the heck we wanted with anything we wanted on the John D. Operation Center, period. And that's when we pretty much stopped because we pretty much had root on the whole organization. And obviously we gave all this information directly to John Deere in record time. We actually had to get CESA involved because they were not responsive and CESA actually took over for a bit and helped them re remediate the vulnerabilities. 
Uh, then we move on to the second manufacturer, so Case IH. This is the last one we'll look at because I've only got 20 minutes. Um, and the other ones aren't actually fixed yet, but Case IH is probably the biggest competitor. So it's Case International Harvesting plus New Holland. They're all amalgamated. They like to buy each other out. And they're also super connected tractors. It's the Magnum series with a, I guess, Trimble display. Uh, same sort of stuff, but that's an Android-based one. Fantastically, again, we've got remote access 300 miles away. I think you can get access from a little bit farther away than that, but your case on H dealer uh, will be able to access your account remotely from just literally just your ID of your account. And that's the guy there. And I'll just mention this briefly because he's got 24 pens in his little pen holder. I just think that's funny. Um, but uh, yeah, he's controlling your tractors. Um, so worry about that. This is the Java Melody server that we found with Case IH. Um, yeah, we could just browse the Java Melody server for your sessions. This is all Brazilian data for some reason. I forgot to blur out his IP, but uh, basically he's a Chrome user. I've got his session ID, so I can obviously just you know replicate that session. I can just log in as that user by duplicate, just copying that session ID in the top left that I blurred out. And there's a list of sessions and how old they are and all the attributes allowed to them or sorry attributes assigned to them like you know username first name last name etc uh, i'll just show you another user we're looking at here it's got the full name bottom right which i have to blur out obviously scope so what they're allowed to use um, and then they've got the session id again and their ip address and this is all publicly accessible which is ridiculous and then the bottom of that java melody if you've used it before there's a couple of cool functions you can do all sorts of cool shit like invalidate all the sessions or execute the garbage collector or you can even reboot it which we accidentally did for research purposes only or well, we killed one process and then took a while came back on the next day um but uh yeah just by having that just as an example that was a uh, that's an example of a denial of service that, we, that was done in good faith obviously it was accidental we can see a lot of stuff we can do with java melody first of all it shouldn't be exposed second we shouldn't be able to invalidate everyone's sessions um, and we shouldn't be able to see them either uh, and then I'm just honing in on the invalidation there. So we actually had a lot of hard time getting into contact with these companies. I'm talking like, we're talking like weeks to get in contact with these companies. Absolutely ridiculous. Uh, this is an email from, this is an email that we sent in April, printed out, bound into a book by Willie and delivered, hand delivered to the John Deere headquarters because they wouldn't reply to us in any shape, way, shape or form. Just reminding them that we've identified a ton of risks, namely that we can log in as anyone on John Deere's platform, and that that should probably get looked into. And we hand deliver this one. So this is a photo that Willie took at the CNH headquarters up the road from his place in Illinois. And you can see there it's got security office, so that's obviously where we dropped it off. COVID restrictions were in place, so it was pretty hard to get in touch with someone there, Willie said. But he eventually handed it off to someone who had no idea what they were doing with that. Um, and we didn't actually hear back from them about this. So we ended up getting through to them in the compliance portal, weirdly enough. Uh, but the only way to get in contact with Case, I rang them a few times and were extremely rude. Uh, I, put the, I put the phone calls on my website. They were hilarious. They're actually like bizarre, the way that they spoke to us. But the way that I got into contact with them is through this weird link in their compliance and governance page called the CNH Industrial Compliance Helpline.com. So when you read when you go to that website, you get redirected to a third party called Navex Global, who's very popular in this sort of field. Um, Ethics Point, it's called, where you can get in touch with a third party that will relay info back to the manufacturer. And we ended up chatting to them and asking them, you know, is it safe to provide the reports over this channel? They said, we are case. I said, are you sure? It looks like Navix to me. But yeah, apparently that actually worked. And eventually we got in contact with them. They fixed them and then we never heard from them again. Um, just back on John Deere. And I'll just finish with this unit. This is the MG 4G LTE gateway. This is the brains of the device. This is the brains of every tractor. It goes on every tractor and apparently it goes on buses, as you can see in the top left-hand corner. Um, this is a fully loaded device, runs Yocto Linux, certified in 70 countries, whatever that means. A full IP67 container, so it can run in like snow or like super heat. Um, it's got SIM card, it's got satellite uh, connections, it's got Wi-Fi connections, it's got Bluetooth connections. Um, and here's what it looks like with the IP67 case all hooked up. And it's what it looks like with a JTAGulator hooked up to it. Uh, and we pretty much still haven't got access to this device. It's proving to be a little bit difficult and I actually spoke to the guy Joe Grant who made the Jetagulator about it and he gave me some pointers about it. 
the easiest way to get around it would probably be just to ask John Deere for the source code. So that's what's ongoing at the moment. Uh, apparently we're allowed to obtain a complete copy of the corresponding source code for the entire device, uh, which I've sent to him about two months ago and I'm still waiting. And apparently it's in the works and uh, they've said to me that I'm getting it in a few weeks and I don't understand how it could take a few weeks to desanitize a source code project where it's someone prior to me who probably has actually asked for this source code. So they should be just on hand. I don't really understand how it can take weeks to get a GPL request of them done. And secondly, it's valid to anyone who receives this information. So you don't even need it. And apparently they were asking us for serial numbers and stuff, and what's our serial number. But I refer to the offer which says, uh, I refer to their offer, which is valid for anyone in receipt of this information. Um, what I found actually delving into this device is it's got a Qualcomm chip in there. And we all know that Qualcomm has serious problems at the moment. Uh, the MDM 9215 chip specifically, along with about 70 chips that run that run uh, like Snapdragon and things like that. Uh, pretty much a monthly CVE roster for these devices, like critical, critical, critical and high ones. And so it says at the bottom there, OEMs have been notified and encouraged to patch these issues. So I'd say if you're not being encouraged to patch the issues, you're actually insane because these are ridiculously vulnerable bugs. You can see the top one there, 2020, and the bug was actually published in middle of 2021. So it's a serious critical vulnerability that there's not much information about, but just patch, patch, patch. Um, and I'll just say thanks for everyone for listening. Um, this was originally a 45 minute talk. You can visit us all on Twitter. We've all got different Twitters or you can Google us. And thanks everyone for watching. And I hope you guys have a great end of your DEF CON and get involved with the farming industry. It's not. There's no barrier to entry. It's a really cool industry to get involved with. There's a lot of YouTube videos about how things work and you can really find out some interesting stuff and get some value out of hacking uh, farms because all the work that you do is pretty much used to feed everyone. So fantastic and have a great night everyone and thanks for listening to the talk.